All right, so this is the session on building API modules, also known as making your module extensible. Um, just, I assume most of you guys have all had experience, uh, you know, developing custom modules and, and doing Drupal development, yes? No? Maybe? In between somewhere? Okay. Um, what we're going to talk about here, uh, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am Adam Gregory. I've been a Drupal developer, themer, consultant, and trainer, um, and I've been using Drupal uh, pretty much exclusively for about the past five years. I've been doing web development uh, in general for about the past 10 years. Um, I actually build and maintain numerous modules on Drupal.org. Uh, it's somewhere between 12 and 15 at this point, and uh, I've been involved in Drupal projects large and small. Uh, one of the biggest projects I've, I've worked on was Major League Soccer and all of their teams migrating to Drupal uh, last year. And I've worked on stuff from that all the way down to, you know, mom and pop small businesses locally that just need a, a quick Drupal install set up. Um, I recently released the, my, my first sort of API module. Uh, you know, it's a, a module that really allows for other modules to integrate with it and really use it as uh, an API to do some cool stuff. Um, the Peacemaker API, which Peacemaker is a sort of 3D uh, slideshow, um, and I, I built the module in a way that allows, though I haven't implemented it yet, but allows integration with, with views. It allows, uh, it basically allows anybody who wants to to be able to take this API, feed it some data, and be able to get a 3D slideshow spat out on the other end. Um, so it really uh, is an example of how to build your module with other developers in mind so that they can actually use what you're doing. Um, and I'm actually in the process of converting the theme editor module on Drupal.org into a more API structure so that other modules can, once again, be able to integrate better with it and uh, be able to modify a, a lot of what it does. So what we'll cover, uh, obviously we'll cover what is an API, um, and then how it applies to building modules. And then we'll cover, you know, how do I code an API module? We'll go through some of the planning, the, the proper structures, the Drupal coding standards, coding and testing. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some examples, um, release, and then releasing it into a while. That's sort of the basic uh, flow for how you're gonna work through this. And then we'll look at some real-world world examples, such as views, which is probably, you know, we all know what views is, and it, it's the most used API in Drupal, practically. Um, you know, it's highly extensible. Uh, the way it's written from the ground up is for us as developers to be able to add functionality and features to it and abilities that just aren't there on its own, because as smart as Earl is, you know, he's only one guy, and he's already swamped anyways. Um, and definitely, just as a plug for him, if you're, you know, going to be around tomorrow, go to his session, because he's, like, top three Drupal developers in the world, and, uh, you know, we're really lucky to be able to have him come out. So we'll look at views, uh, we'll look at the piece paper module I just wrote, uh, and we'll look at, you know, any other examples. And then last, we'll do a quick question and answer. All right. So, what is an API? Um, I would ask who knows, but obviously it's on the screen already. So, an API is an application programming interface, um, and it really covers everything nowadays, you know, from something like the Twitter API, which is really a web service um, that allows you to interact with their data through your software, uh, to an actual API within code, like the Views API or the Database API in Drupal that allows you to interact with other code uh, and be able to have your code play nice with it. Um, so as I said, it's, it's, it allows other codes, programs, modules to reutilize its utilities, resources, and or services. So like I said, in the case of Twitter, you're really using it as a service. You're not actually interacting with Twitter's code you're interacting with its service and its data, but it's feeding you its resources, which are, is a Twitter stream, 
and you're using its utilities, which are things like search or uh, you know finding a specific user or getting a timeline. With views, it's you know you're using the the base views utilities of styles and plugins and uh, fields and filters, and it's giving you the resources of that data that it's pulling, um, and then you're using it just its code as a service. Uh, basically, what it does is it provides for a more efficient code base in Drupal. Uh, usually, if it's written correctly, um, what it does is it, it tries to cut down on duplicate code. If you're writing your module correctly as an API, you want to write it so that other people don't have to, uh, you know, copy and paste it into their code to use it. You want to provide them the utilities to be able to use your functionality without them having to duplicate it. Um, that happens a lot, especially with uh, Drupal modules, especially with some of the older ones, is it's written in such a way that, well, I just want to use this piece of it, and I can't do that because it's not written correctly, so I just have to end up copying and pasting their function and, and rewriting it within my own module. Um, so that's definitely part of the planning phase, is to really think about how people could possibly use the code that you're doing and write it in such a way that they have access to its functionality without having to, you know, duplicate it. And basically, Drupal, essentially, it's a big, giant API. Um, or rather, a, a group and collection of APIs, from the field API to the database API to the batch API to uh, its entire module system, the entire hook system is an API, you could say. Um, so Drupal's really built from the ground up as an API. Um, even the whole service, if you just took the whole platform itself is almost an API for building websites and, and interacting on the web. How do I code an API module? Um, yeah. Code, pray, test, throw your, yell, throw your computer in the pool, give up, and become a monk. Because it's, you know, writing code and testing code is a pain in the butt. Um, but then when you start having to take into account how other people are going to use your code and how other people are going to interact with your code, it just becomes more difficult. Because how many of you here have cheated before when you've written code and just said, you know what, I know I should do it this way, but I'm just going to do it the quick way. Yeah, everybody that writes code, yeah. So it, it really becomes a, a lot of times much more of a pain when you're, you start thinking about writing your code as an API to make it available to others because there's certain things you have to do and there's certain ways that you have to do it that sort of cut out that little, you know, cheating thing we like to do as coders. So planning. Planning is essential. Uh, you know, I, I like this quote by General Patton. You know, I used to be in the Army, and uh, so I love the guy. A good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. Um, or as Google likes to put it, release early and release often. Uh, get a plan, but don't you know, get a plan that you can actually implement. Don't spend all your time sitting on a whiteboard talking about how this module you're going to build is going to be so awesome. Get a basic plan and then start implementing it. Start testing, and, and we'll go through some of that. But, you know, use a whiteboard, a mind map, a pad of paper. Um, mind maps are great. If you don't have an application that does mind mapping, there's a bunch of open source ones, but they give you uh, a real good way to be able to create flow charts and you know, relational charts that will help you really visualize how your code is going to interact with the database layer, with other code, the functionalities it's going to provide. Um, so I would highly encourage the use of a mind map. If you don't, you know, if you're old school, use a whiteboard or a pad of paper and just draw stuff out. Um, you know, whiteboards are great. You can draw out all your stuff and then erase it when you're done. Um, think through all of the possible uses. Uh, really think about it. You know, ask other people, get some opinions. Within the Drupal community, what's really great is that it is a community. You know, you're not, no one's going to steal your idea. You know, no one's going to go, although I do say steal ideas, but uh, we'll mention that in, in a minute. But, you know, no one's going to, you're not going to go into a Drupal IRC chat room and go, you know, I was thinking about building this module that does this, and then have someone else come in and go, oh, that's a cool idea. I'm going to steal that and go do it before they do it, you know, because what's the, what's the point? You know, we're not, we're not building modules and contributing, contributing them back because it's putting money in our pockets necessarily. You know, we're doing it for the better of the Drupal community. So 
you know, talk with other people about it, get other opinions. And then, like I said, steal ideas, but in the good way, in the open source way. You know, look at what other people have done. Look at how other people have implemented uh, their code and their APIs, and feel free to, to steal their, their ideas of, oh, that's really cool. I love how they ran the, their, uh, you know, ran their, their functions through this class, or I love how they set up their structure in this module. Feel free to steal ideas. That's what open source is all about. That's what makes it great, is that you can do that without really, uh, you know, you're not infringing on somebody's right. You're not going to upset somebody, you know. They'll, they'll be happy that you liked their idea and implemented it in your own code. So some of the proper structures. Uh, really, I, I would highly suggest, if you can, if, if you know you have enough code and it really requires using classes. Um, I know Drupal in the past has been very object unfriendly as far as PHP is concerned. Um, it's been very highly, you know, functional and uh, functional based and or procedural based. Uh, but it is moving towards more of an uh, OOP model. Um, one of the biggest benefits of that in Drupal 7 is that we have auto-loading of classes. So, you know, if you're writing your, your implementation, your API, and you're using a class, it's going to be much more efficient. It's going to be much better performance because, you know, Drupal auto-load that when other people want to uh, extend it or implement it. Uh, you know, it'll auto-load that feature, and they don't have to do includes and figure out where you're classes stored. So that's one of the biggest benefits in Drupal 7 to doing that. The other, the, the downside of that though is that if you're going to use classes, you have to learn the right way to uh, initialize them. You can't just call, uh, you know, my variable equals new my class. Because if you're writing it as an API, remember, you're writing it with keeping in mind that you want people to be able to uh, extend that class. So you want to be able to call their extension if that's what they want. Um, you know, some examples of this are, are in the Apache Solar module, you know, where it, you can set the class in a, a Drupal variable, and then it uses that Drupal variable to call the class name. Um, so you just want to be careful that you're not hard coding in your class name, um, but that you're providing people the ability to change what that default class that gets called is, you know, through Drupal variables or, or hooks or a lot of different ways that we'll kind of go over that you can do that. Um, and the last point, like I said, classes are easily extendable. People can extend them and overwrite your functions, add to them, uh, and really just make it a, a lot more customizable to what they want. Um, and they can do it all a lot easier with a class than if you write standard PHP functions and, and do all your code procedurally. So hooks. You know, essentially Drupal is a, it's a hooker system that runs completely off, off uh, hook calls. Um, so you can write an entire API that only uses hooks. You can write it procedurally, so you know, you don't, if you're not comfortable with object-oriented programming, that's fine. You know, write it procedurally and really utilize the hooks. Even if you do write object-oriented uh, code, as your API, you're going to need to use hooks anyways because you're going to need to get information from other modules. You're going to need to be able to uh, implement different things through other modules because that's really what makes Drupal so extensible is that you can do that. So you're going to be using hooks no matter what. Um, and it's really the powerful, the most powerful thing in Drupal. Coding standards. How many of you guys actually follow Drupal coding standards every time you write code? Only one person. Yeah, that's, that's probably about right. Um, you know, I try to. I, you know, I, I set my uh, development environment up to try to force me to, but it doesn't always happen. Um, you know, and I, I break some of these rules a, a lot of times. But if you really want your module to be extens extensible and uh, be a good API, you have to adhere to Drupal coding standards because that's what people are going to expect, and if they don't get that, it's going to make it harder for people to actually use the code you're writing. So some common mistakes, not using a theme function for HTML output. If you're writing something that's going to spit out HTML, it should be spitting it out through a theme function. You shouldn't be hard coding HTML just into a regular 
a, you know, a regular function that gets called because you know, developer B that comes along behind you that's trying to use your API doesn't like the fact that you're using tables and he wants to do it completely in a fluid grid with divs. He can't do that if you've hard coded it. Uh, you know, it needs to be in a theme function where he can override it and he can put his own code in and you know, it, it really opens it up. And then even for you know, front end themers, you know, we want them to be able to change their HTML code. So don't hard code uh, HTML into your module unless it's in a theme function or a TPL file. Not using Drupal Alter. That's a big thing. You know, if you're writing uh, an API function, the Drupal Alter uh, function is really powerful because it, it opens up uh, it opens up your data to be changed by other functions as they you know see fit and other modules. So use that Drupal Alter if you you know if you're not familiar with it, go to the the api.drupal.org site and just look it up. But you know it's it's basically a neat little wrapper for uh, module invoke all, and it'll run your your uh, variables or your data through any module that implements that alter. Um, and it'll, like I said, it allows other modules to alter your data, you know, in ways that they want for what they're using. And then the back, the the probably one of the biggest common mistakes is not documenting your code. How many of you guys have ever opened up a code file? and tried to just read through the code to figure out what was going on because it didn't have any commenting or it didn't have any uh, PHP docs for the function. I mean, it's absolutely hideous. You know, I, I, find, I, I tend to think I'm pretty good at debugging code and pretty good at reading code to understand what's going on, but it's horrible without comments because you have no clue why they did what they did. And you might look at it and go, oh, I wouldn't have done that but you don't have an explanation for why they did. And maybe they did it for a certain reason. So if you're writing your code, you're writing your API, document the heck out of it. You know, there, there's, you can't have too much documentation. There's no such thing, you know. It might make your file size, you know, a few kilobytes bigger, but it's not gonna kill, you know, the performance. You know, so document your code. You do that through PHP doc, um, that's a, a, a standard documenting format for PHP. You can find more information about that on the drupal.org slash coding dash standards page. Um, but also using a, a file called whatever your module name is. In this case, I just used an example, api.php. And that's where you create uh, some sort of example functions or example class implementations uh, that show how people can actually integrate with your module. And we'll kind of go over why we do that in a few moments. So once you've uh, planned your your uh, planned your module out and you decide you're going to you know stick to your Drupal coding standards, you just got to start coding. You got to code it, test, code, test, code, test. Um, you know if you've done your planning correctly, this will be a much easier phase. Um, if you've really thought through the end users and the other developers, this phase is going to be a lot quicker. And then so give examples, going back to the examples API and the, and the document in your code. If your code uses hooks, which it's going to if you're using Drupal and you're developing an API, give some examples. Either actually code some modules, you know, like code the first module that uses your API, or in that examples.api.php, um, create these example functions that show how to actually hook into your API and how to, how to implement it. Um, without that, people aren't going to use it. You might have just written or wrote the most awesome API out there, but if people don't have some examples and some documentation and uh, you haven't shown them how to use it, they're just going to you know, be like, oh, you know, they don't know how awesome it is, so give them the examples that they need. All right, so release into the wild. Uh, you're done, right? No, not really. Once you release that code, you know, you realize you're going to have to spend some time supporting it. Um, you know, you're going to have to provide some documentation on Drupal.org. Outside of just your PHP documentation, go write some actual pages. 
here's the module I just wrote. Here's how you can implement your code. Uh, you know, here's how your code can implement it. Here's how you can extend it. You know, you're going to have to answer issues. You're going to have to fix bugs, all that stuff. And then you're going to make new releases, and you're just going to keep going through that cycle. All right, so let's look at some code, because that's really what it's all about. We can talk about it all day, but if we don't look at some... All right, so first I want to kind of go through this, this module that I just uh, released uh, last month, the Peacemaker module, and kind of show some examples of, of how I was, uh, how I implemented it as an API and how I made it available to other modules to use. Uh, the first thing you'll notice, like I said, is that there is this peacemaker.api.php function. And that's where I've included the examples of the hooks that I've used. Um, just a little smaller. So you can see in here that I've given an example of this one hook that the, the Peacemaker API really uses as uh, the primary, uh, this is really the primary part of the API that really does all the work is through the, the handlers. And I've told people, you know, I've documented, I've said this is how modules define different handlers for the Peacemaker API, and here's what it's supposed to return, and then here's an example. And then I've gone down here and I've given an example of what uh, another function and how that's going to work. So let's look at how those are actually implemented within Peacemaker. So what Peacemaker basically does is it creates it creates, like I said, a 3D uh, it creates an API, it's an API for creating 3D flash slideshows on your website. Uh, a lot, very similar to probably a much wider known one, Cuber, uh, but Cuber is not open source and Peacemaker is. So I actually built this specifically for um, my web development shop for our homepage to be able to have this functionality. Um, and, and what I did is I actually created the Peacemaker API module and then it created a sub-module included with that package called Peacemaker Blocks. And so we'll actually look at the Peacemaker API, and then we'll look at the Peacemaker Blocks so you can see how the two actually interact with each other. So what the Peacemaker needs to work is it needs an XML file, basically, that tells it uh, the different photos to load and the different transition effects to use. So what I did is I created a menu uh, item this first menu item right here, that will basically use all of the different, uh, that, that any different module that implements this Peacemaker API, they're going to, by default, run through this XML menu item. And so how it works is basically um, it passes a handler into the menu array, into the menu, and that's where this hook Peacemaker handlers comes in. Um, and so the, the handler actually tells the Peacemaker module, okay, for this handler name, this is the function we're going to call, and this is the access function that we're going to call to make sure people actually have access to it. So what we can do with that is we can actually create, uh, you know, we could create a views plugin style, uh, which is something I'm working on so that, you know, you could create a Peacemaker uh, slideshow through views. Um, you know, there's the Peacemaker blocks, uh, but you know, then we can control access, we can, each implementation can have its own settings and, and can really manage how it handles all that. And so what we do is we go down here and we'll see some more items. Um, you know, this we load our handlers. So what you'll see here is the, the Peacemaker Handlers function. This is really where the API comes into play, is that it implements module invoke all. 
what module invoke all does is that's what actually calls a module hooks, the, the hooks in a module. So for example, you know, the pretty much most common hook that any module uses, hook menu, uh, is called through the Drupal system using module invoke all and then menu. And what that does is that runs through and it will basically do a dynamic function call for each and every module that has a function of my module underscore menu. Um, so that's really where the magic happens in an API function um, that's using something like module invoke all. And that's how hooks are executed in Drupal. So what we do with, with this function is we run, uh, we run module invoke all on the peacemaker handler hook right there. And we get back our entire array of all these different handlers. And then we store those, you know, I, I use a, I, I store them in a static array so that I only have to call it once per page load. Um, saves some performance. And then it returns them and it calls using, you know, the call user function. It actually calls that function dynamically. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to call it by name. There's another implementation of call user function for classes, so you can actually call a specific method of a class, or you can call a specific class dynamically without actually having to know the name ahead of time. So you don't have to hard code functions into your PHP. You don't have to hard code classes into your PHP. You can use these dynamic, uh, these basically dynamic calls to them. And Drupal uses this call user function a lot in its code. Um, it's probably one of the more, more used ones because of how Drupal works with the hooks. So, and then the, one of the main things that, that happens is that, one of the main ways that the Peacemaker actually gets called is through a theme function. So, you know, in my Peacemaker block, what I do is I just call this theme Peacemaker function and then I pass it the variables that it needs and it goes through and it dynamically grabs the handler and creates, uh, basically creates the HTML output, all this different stuff, and then loads, you can see right here, it tells it the different, the dynamic XML file to call, and then that runs back through the hook menu, calls the dynamic handler, outputs the data, and we've got a dynamic API function. Um, so that's an example of, you know, using that with a procedural based system. You know, you're, you're using it to just call different functions dynamically, but you're opening up what your module does so other things can implement it. An example that really uses object oriented is the views module. Um, and it uses it heavily and it really uh, uses the ability to sort of extend on its base classes how you do a lot of things. Are there any questions? Feel free if you have questions at any point, just shout it out. So the views, um, once again, one of the, the things that I had mentioned is code some examples into your module, you know, code the first implementations of how to use your module. Views is a perfect example of where this happens um, because they have their basic views modules right there. But what they do is they actually code all the initial plugins um, for their module, for views. So you can see uh, like the node module, they've already coded and given an example of, okay, this is how you actually implement uh, our API. So they've given these, these examples already. And a lot of times I'm, you know, if I'm creating some views uh, extensions, I'm just going in and copying stuff and then tweaking it a little bit. And that really makes it easier for developers to actually use your, your API if there's something that you've already coded that they can just copy and paste and then tweak. Um, rather than trying to sit there and read through your code and how it works and then having to hand code all of their own stuff out, give them some examples, make it easy for them to just copy, paste, and tweak. So with views, if you're not familiar with views, views is, you know, 
just displays as a, a query builder that displays data. Um, where views really uses the object oriented approach is in its handlers. Um, and its handlers basically are different ways to display data or to manipulate data and different ways that it um, will filter, sort, all sorts of stuff. But you can see by default they sort of include this view, views handler. And it's implemented in object oriented language. Um, so it's implemented where it's extending a, a base class and then this views handler field actually extends or, or is extended even more into some of these other ones. For example, you know, so now we're extending the views handler field. But the way this works, the way it calls all these, is that it actually uses, um, you can see when we're defining our, our data for nodes, we're telling it, okay, call this handler. So you're still going to have, even if you implement stuff in an object-oriented fashion, you're still going to have to use some procedural stuff because Drupal's not 100% object-oriented yet. You're still going to have to implement some procedural code for people to be able to tell you, this is my class name. So, you know, over here, for this field, it's implementing views handler field node, which is in here somewhere. So, you know, this, once again, this is extending another class, but it really opens it up because, uh, you know, now they, they have the ability to extend your class, but also um, to provide some of their own functionality in it. Um, and classes are really great for that uh, because you can provide a baseline code in your own API, a baseline class, and really just allow people to either just use that or extend and, and implement that in whatever way they want. Um, by being able to, to override it. Um, and, and so the way, you know, views handles this. Um, in views for Drupal 6, what would have to happen is that views would run through this data set, this hook data, and it would gather all this data about it. And then it would have to go through and individually include this class file every time it used it. Um, you know, it'd have to do a, a Drupal include file or module load include or a just regular old PHP include once. The great thing about Drupal 7 is that we don't have to do that anymore. Um, if you basically just include any class into your info file in files, it all gets cached in a, uh, in a special code cache and it will basically automatically call it on the fly. So if I was to go in and say, you know, uh, new views handler field node, I don't, have to I don't have to load the include file before that. So anybody in Drupal 7, if you're using object oriented, they don't have to worry about loading your file or where your file loca is located and it doesn't have to get loaded when it's not needed. So that's a big reason to really use object-oriented programming in Drupal 7 uh, because it, it all automatically loads and it will, uh, it really helps improve the performance in Drupal 7 because you're not having to worry about having these files loaded that aren't needed or, um, you know, loading files, you know, implicitly, to, you know, telling something to be loaded. It can just be as simple as just calling a new class name and then it automatically gets loaded. So, right. so does anybody have any questions at this point? Does anybody want to look at anything in particular? Um, you know, do you have any thoughts, ideas? I'm open for, for Q&A and, and kind of discussion about, about this. Um, so, shoot. Yeah? Do you have to know the example module and that stuff like this? Uh, the example module will give you, 
I haven't. I don't remember if I've looked at it for Drupal seven yet. But uh, you know, at the very least, it'll give you examples of how to implement core hooks in your own module. So it'll give you examples of how to implement an API. Yeah, but like, No, it's not necessarily going to show you how to call them. Um, a good example. I don't know if I have it installed on this machine. Uh, a good example, like I said, was uh, even in Drupal 6, the Apache Solar module sort of uh, will dynamically call a, a, a solar class, um, but it does it through using just Drupal's variable git, you know, Drupal's variable system. So, you know, a, a developer can go in and set the solar class default to their class and that'll get called uh, automatically when solar you know starts a new solar search it creates a new solar instance of you know my class rather than the default apache solar class um, but you just you're going to do that really once again through procedural code because drupal works off the, the hook system and it works off more or less procedural system at this point um, so even if you're really implementing object-oriented code in your API, you know, you're still going to have to implement some hooks somewhere so you can actually get the data from, uh, you know, the other modules that implement your API. Is there any, like, uh, Unfortunately, not yet for Drupal 7. There's discussion going on right now in Drupal, around Drupal 8, about sort of standardizing the way we use classes and, and namespacing them and such. Um, but it's really just discussion at this point, as everything with Drupal 8 really is. Um, so there's not really a, a, a sort of standard uh, way to do it yet in Drupal. Um, and mainly that comes from the fact that it's just not, Drupal's not object-oriented, so it's really hodgepodge and how people do it. Some and a lot of people will implement their, their OOP through different um, through different styles. You know, and there's just it, it depends on you know kind of how you want to do it, but also how you think is going to be the most useful uh, you know for the other developers that are going to use your API. So I imagine planning your speaker obvious ideas about methods you want to implement the API. Were there things that you added in there specifically by others suggested from other people suggesting how you do it or maybe early adopters that gave you suggestions? Or, or how did you decide on what things to implement? Um, well, initially I was, with, with that specific instance, I'm limited to what the Peacemaker uh, flash code can actually do. Um, so there is some limitations there. You know, I, you know, I didn't write the flash code and I never could because I hate flash, but, um, you know, so I was limited to really the documentation that was provided with that about what it could do. And that sort of limited how I could implement it. Um, but, you know, as, as I've released it, I've gotten, gotten feedback on how it works and how other people would like to use it and what they would like to see. You know, like I said, off the bat, I included just a sort of blocks module that enabled users to create blocks because, you know, what's an API if there's not an actual implementation of it, you know, for people to use? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm planning on implementing some views, you know, a, a views plugin style for it so that you could create it through views, um, you know, some field formatters have been suggested, you know, in Drupal 7, so you could upload 10 images to an image field, and then for your display formatter, select Peacemaker, and it would spit it out as a Peacemaker slideshow. Um, so there's there's been suggestions as it's been released about, hey, let's use it this way. Can you can you code it to do this? How can we use it? Um, but initially, going into planning, I was really kind of limited to the actual capabilities of that that API itself, so. Other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, 
Yeah, so like with views, um, what happens is views implements things called plugins um, to basically handle its different styles. Um, and so when you're using views, when you're using a views instance, you know, you've got all the different little blocks of and sections for you know display and arguments and fields and um, sorting and filters. So the way views implements that is through plugins. So we've got argument plugins, uh, display plugins, pager plugins now in, in views three, and then style plugins. So an example of a style plugin would be um, you know, display as an HTML list, display as unformatted, or display as a table. Um, and that's actually where I'm going to implement a, a plugin with the Peacemaker is, is as a, a style plugin. Um, so you can see that once again they implement this all in object oriented so that the plug <coughs> the table plugin extends just the base plugin style. So with views, almost anything you do with uh, uh, views is going to end up being an extension of a base class. So that's an example when you're building your API, build base classes. You know, if you're going to implement stuff, build base classes so that other people can extend them. Um, and, and an example here is that views goes through and there's uh, options definitions so that people can uh, set the different options. There's sorting. And then the main one that actually gets called to output it is the render function somewhere. You know, there's a, an options form so that people can override the options. At the bottom. I miss it somewhere. Oh, actually, yeah. In, in views, the way it works is that um, when you create a plugin style, it actually create a themable function that actually renders the output. So once again, HTML in a themable function, so it can be overridden. Um, and that actually is in the, the theme include in views for the different plugins. Um, but you know, views like if you really want to learn how to build a strong API module, views is the place to start. It's really extensive, it's really big, and it's sync and complicated sometimes, but you know, it really shows how to allow other people to hook into your module. And that's why Views is the number one downloaded module and the number one used module in Drupal is because you know it was built from the very start to be extendable. Yeah. The thing that's cool about views and the hooks in the C tools, C tools have another really great API and they actually work together. Well, yeah. So by doing views with C tools, you can see how they interface together. And C tools is another great API to get yeah. started. Because in Drupal uh, uh, 7 with entities and a lot of things like that, uh, there's lots of things that uh, the C tools API is something that you can Yeah, and they're both written uh, you know, by, by Earl Miles, Merlin of Chaos, who's coming tomorrow to present. Um, and like I said, he's like top three developers in Drupal, and the guy writes really great API modules. Every module he, he maintains, you know, whether it's views or panels or C tools and a couple other small ones are really good at being extendable. Um, so uh, almost anything you look at that he's written is probably going to be really heavy on the code side. I mean, it's there can be complicated to just look at, but they're really great examples of how to structure your code in order for other people to be able to utilize it properly. So, any other questions? All right. I've got a $5 Starbucks gift card. Is, hmm, got to come up with a good question. See, my last session was, what is Drupal? So. I just gave it to the person who had the newest Drupal account, which was last night. You guys, though, probably already all have Drupal accounts, though, right? Yeah. Um, who has... 
Who's been a Drupal.org member the longest here? Let's go with that. If you've been a Drupal.org member longer than three years, four years, five years, six years. Nope. Oh, okay. All right, so that's our session on, on building APIs. Um, I'll be hanging around if you want to talk, and uh, I'll be here all day. <laughs> and tomorrow.